My name is Ian Stocks. I'm a taxonomic entomologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, the groups that I'm responsible for are the, the scales, mealybugs and their relatives, and the allorotidae, which are the white flies. We will begin this taxonomy training program with a brief introduction to Cocoidea, uh, which is the mealybug, scales, and their allies. As you can see from this introductory slide, there's a tremendous amount of morphological diversity that's encompassed within the Cocoidea. And it's the goal of this training program to teach you how to be able to identify any given specimen uh, that may come in front of you. To begin, we'll discuss some of the issues surrounding their biology, movement, and feeding. Uh, the adult female is described as a patamorphic adult. Technically, this means that she's a sexually mature female that still retains the juvenile body form. The males, in contrast, have a type of complete metamorphosis uh, in which they have what is an analog of the pupil stage uh, you're more familiar with perhaps with moths, flies, beetles, wasps, and their relatives. Um, but they actually have two uh, resting pupil stages in which the males go through development um, which results in, in uh, the growth of the wings and the male uh, reproductive structures. Uh, in most cases, they are uh, a winged staged adult, um, but they have no functioning mouth parts, so they're unable to feed, and typically they will live for only a few days. By and large, adult males are not diagnosable to species. The practical taxonomy of Cocoidea relies almost exclusively on the adult female stage, uh, and even though the males have a great deal of morphological interest, um, the taxonomy is not available to use them uh, to get uh, species IDs uh, for most cases. Many species of Cocoidea are parthenogenetic, so no, n no males are needed for reproduction. And of course, this has an important um, ramification when it comes to the movement internationally of plant uh, products and trade, because you may not need an adult male in that population in order for it to um, form a self-sustaining uh, 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 population uh, in a new environment. And some are in fact hermaphroditic, in which they have both male and female gametes in the same uh, adult stage. The most well-known case of this is uh, the cottony cushion scale, Iceria purchasi. I've given a citation at the bottom there, which is a very interesting article on how the biology of this hermaphroditism works. Whether they hatch from an egg or uh, are uh, born live from the adult female, the crawler, or the first stage instar, typically has legs and antennae that are well developed. And this makes sense because as the primary dispersive stage, the legs and antennae are going to help the, uh, the immature uh, negotiate its way around on plant material in search for the suitable feeding site. And again, generally there are no species level diagnostic characters for the crawler or uh, other immature stages. This is not in total true. Uh, there are some cases where uh, the immature stages do have uh, enough characters um, specific to the, that species that they can actually be identified uh, quite readily. For dispersal in the scale-like families, this occurs primarily during the crawler stage. After they molt into the second stage, they are essentially affixed to the plant substrate and won't move again. Um, uh, and won't move again. Uh, for the mealybug-like families, dispersal can continue on the plant material um, throughout uh, other stages, and so they're able to move around on the different parts of the plant um, in between molts. And in fact, some species, for instance, cushion scales, the immatures are typically found on one part of the plant, and the adult females are found on another part of the plant. There are other ways in which crawlers can disperse. Um, first, wind. They can form basically an aerial plankton to move around simply on air currents between hosts. Uh, there's also the phenomenon of phoresis, which is simply being able to hitchhike on birds or insects as they move between plants. And it's also documented that contaminated gardening tools uh, can also move the crawler stage from one plant to another. Cocoidea can be found in basically all terrestrial environments where uh, plants grow. Uh, we can characterize them as obligate pl uh, plant parasites essentially the plant analog of things like ticks, where their uh, biology is essentially um, contained um, in association with their host. By and large, they're restricted to higher plants. Uh, ferns, uh, mealybugs, there are certain species of mealybugs, for instance, which can be quite common on ferns. There are only two 
species recorded um, from horsetails. So by and large, the horsetails, such as Equisetum, are not at least known to be a very good host for uh, scales or mealybugs. And uh, the vast majority of hosts are, for, are found within the group Spermophyta, which includes the ginkgos, cycads, the gymnosperms, such as the firs and pines, and the flowering plants, the angiosperms, though the angiosperms in and of themselves account for uh, by far and away the, the, the vast majority of suitable hosts. All of these insects have piercing sucking mouth parts uh, by which they feed on the vascular system of the plant, the phloem, which is the delivery system for water and photosynthates that the plant is moving. And this is except for the diaspidity, the armored scales. Uh, in, these, uh, in the armored scales, they actually puncture individual plant cells with their mouth parts and probe around in that cellular layer, uh, draining um, the contents of those cells. And this is one of the things that leads to the distinctive chlorosis of armored scale feeding. All plant, uh, parts of the plants are possible feeding sites, um, though it can depend somewhat on uh, what species, stage, or sex is involved. Um, so things like the, the twigs, the stems, leaves, roots, and fruit are all possible um, host sites. We'll now discuss some of the uh, um, relevant information in phylogeny and taxonomy of the Cocoidea. There's been a fairly recent analysis of the relationships amongst the families of the Cocoidea, uh, 2007, by uh, Gullen and Cook, and I, I give the, uh, the citation there for your, uh, for your reference. Currently, there are about 8,000 species described uh, worldwide, but there are uh, almost certainly many, many, many more that are undescribed. And um, probably a, uh, a significant source of those undescribed species are uh, within what we call cryptic species groups. Uh, these are clusters of species that are biologically distinct, but that we are not able to separate based on the traditional approaches of morphology. Uh, a recent example of this is from Anderson et al. Uh, in 2010, where they studied the cryptic diversity in an armored scale uh, complex, uh, the, an armored scale species called Aspidiotus nerii, which forms a complex of species in Australia. And they discovered through molecular means um, that the single name Aspidiotus nerii, uh, based on a morphological understanding, actually corresponds to a number of other species um, uh, when studied in more detail. Depending on the authority that's cited, there are roughly 20 to 32 families of Cocoidea. It is still very unsettled and likely to change with these family arrangements. Um, one of the changes has been to essentially carve up older families into uh, much smaller families with the goal of making them uh, more natural in their inclusion of, of genera. So for instance, there is an old family, uh, family name, the Margarotidae, um, which contained many, many genera. This um, became the superfamily concept, Margarodoidea, and then over time it has been uh, relimited further to include just the, su just, just the single family Margarotidae, which are the ground pearls, and another significant family, the Monophlebidae, which includes the giant scales and cushion scales, and many other families, some of which are quite small. Another example is the armored scale family Diaspididae. At one point, it included two subfamilies, the Phenicococcini and the Diaspidini. Uh, but more recent analysis has shown that the armored scales are actually quite distinct from the date scales, the Phenicococcidae, so they are now classified as separate families. And another example is the genus Puto. Traditionally, this has been included as a type of mealybug or Pseudococcidae in the superfamily concept Neococoidea. But recently, um, uh, we understand this actually to be not very closely related at all to mealybugs, and it's placed in its own family, the Putoidae, in the fairly distantly related group, the Archaeococoidea. The Archaeococoidea is probably an artificial group. Um, in technical language, we mean paraphyletic, meaning that not all of the included groups are necessarily closely related. A general characterization of the group is really not possible, but by and large, they will have abdominal spiracles present, in addition to the one or two pairs on the thorax, and they may have up to two denticles on the claw. 
They will also have three or more sensory pores on each trochanter of the leg. There's a tremendous amount of morphological diversity within this group. Though generally they can be larger, uh, for instance the genus Drositia can be up to 10 millimeters long, and they are more or less um, retain an insect-like uh, body, even though the adult females are still rather larviform. Their overall morpho morphology is less reduced than it is in the uh, other groups, uh, meaning that they generally still retain antennae and legs, but there are, however, some with very aberrant morphology such as the insisted stage of the group um, known as the uh, margarotids or the ground pearls. In contrast, the neococoidea or no neucocoids is a natural group. In technical language, um, they are monophyletic and we believe that these are all very closely related groups of, uh, of, of insects. Worldwide, there are over 7,000 species broken up into approximately 17 families and it's probably a vastly undersampled. So there are probably many parts of the world where there remain uh, uh, many new, uh, many undescribed species. Uh, the most speciose uh, families of Cocoidea are the, uh, the, are the Neococoidea. For instance, the Diaspididae, the largest, has about 2,400 species worldwide. Uh, the Mealybugs have about 2,200 species worldwide. And the Soft Scales have about 1,150 species worldwide. Now they will have two or fewer sensory pores on the trochanter, and it is very common for these to have um, significantly reduced morphology. They will always lack abdominal, abdominal spiracles, they frequently lack uh, legs, antennae, and eyes, and often they will be very small. For instance, the armored scale Carolaspis minima, the adult female uh, beneath the scale is uh, half a millimeter long. Some of the less well-known Neococoidea are the Lecanodiaspididae with the false pit scales, uh, the Asterolecaneidae, the pit scales, the Seracoxidae, the ornate pit scales, and the Caridae, the lac scales. Um, we'll talk about some of those in, in more detail later. And then there's the single um, species Phenicococcus marlidae, known worldwide as the red date scale in the family Phenicococcidae. This is circumtropical and it's found exclusively on species of phoenix palms. Another reasonably familiar family, uh, family is the uh, Dactylopeidae or the cochineal scales. Uh, there are 10 species in the single genus Dactylopius and it's thought that this genus is, is endemic to the New World. And this has been for uh, many years the source of cochineal dye, which is carminic acid. A somewhat larger family are the felt scales and their allies, the Ariococcidae. There are about 670 species worldwide, and this is probably a paraphyletic group. Um, so there are probably a number of genera included or excluded from this current concept uh, that render it um, not a very uh, um, uh, not a very natural grouping of genera. For instance, the genus Dactylopius. Uh, mentioned above in the family Dactylopeidae, is in all probability uh, another Ariococcid genus. Now we'll discuss some of the signs and evidence of Cocoidea activity that you might encounter, uh, either surveying for plant material or um, seeing it as it comes in through uh, inspection and regulatory uh, uh, circumstances. In terms of plant damage, no presentation is diagnostic of Cocoidea damage. There are a number of other problems you might find with plants that could mimic or resemble um, the feeding activity of Cocoidea. Some of these include nutrient deficiency, uh, toxicity, and pathogens such as virus, bacteria, or uh, even fungi. Now there are some things that are suggestive of, of um, the presence of insect pests. Uh, patchy leaf chlorosis, for instance, this slide at the top, this yellowish area here is indicative of the damage caused by the feeding of the scale insect, the armored scale insect here, as it punctures and drains the contents of individual cells. Um, you might also see a uh, twig dieback called witch's broom if the infestations um, get quite high. And as the insects remove water and photosynthates from the plant vascular system, you might see leaf wilting, otherwise known as flagging. And if this continues, it might lead to dead areas within the canopy. There are also some other things that are indicative of Cocoidea presence. Uh, for instance, wax, though this is not 
uh, restricted to Cocoidea. Many other uh, related groups in the Homoptera uh, also produce wax, and in fact, some beetles do as well. Um, but attending by ants is often a very good indicator that plant feeding insects uh, uh, are present. Um, honeydew is also a significant um, uh, indicator that uh, Cocoidea uh, or their relatives are present. Now, honeydew is the excess carbohydrate and water that is excreted um, um, by the scale in the form of a droplet. And very often what you'll see is ants, when they're tending the scales, you'll see them manipulating their antenna over the, over the body of the scale um, in a way that entices the scale to release that droplet of honeydew so they can feed on it. And in return, the ants offer some protection against predators and parasitoids to the scales. Also associated with honeydew is the buildup of sooty molds on the surface of the uh, leaves. Sooty molds are various species of, of molds that are opportunistic and will proliferate on the found leaf or bark um, uh, surface um, and feed on the, the, the honeydew. Um, over time, this blocks transpiration, which is the movement of water across the cell, uh, across the leaf, uh, respiration, the movement of gases, and will also reduce um, or in some cases completely eliminate uh, photosynthesis of the leaf. And also in humans, it can contribute to mold allergy. This is a list of the collaborators that associate in producing this training program. And at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions from the audience. How can I make sure that the specimen is an adult female? Well, depending on uh, which taxon you're, you're looking at there, uh, you would look for uh, different kinds of features. Uh, mealybugs, for instance, uh, since, since all of these things essentially require the adult female, you do need to ensure that that's what you're looking at. Uh, mealybugs, um, only adult females have a vulva. Uh, so if it doesn't have a vulva, it's either because you can't see it because it wasn't slide mounted properly or it's not an adult female. Uh, other characters for say, for say mealybugs that might help are uh, the presence of multilocular pores. Those are restricted to adult females. But then again, not all species have multilocular pores. The same is true for translucent pores on the hind legs. When they're present, they're present only in the adult female stage. But again, not all species of mealybugs will have those. Um, for soft scales, um, uh, you look for other uh, characters. Um, the asymmetry of the um, uh, tarsal digitules is, is uh, indicative of adult females. There'll be one that is larger than the other. And also, typically, they have multilocular pores around the anogenital area. Uh, immature, um, immature female soft scales will completely lack those. And other characters are used um, for other uh, groups of, of, of soft scales. How important is the host information? Is it, does it really matter what the, the host plant is? Yeah, host information is, is vital in the grand scheme of things in the taxonomy of, of, of scale insects like it is for any group that is uh, uh, intimately associated in its life history with, with plants. Now, in terms of practical taxonomy, it, it, it rarely will ever be used in the Cocordia um, in making a final determination, but it can be used to help solidify an identification or narrow down possibilities. Uh, most of these groups are not strictly uh, monophagous, meaning that they are uh, tied exclusively to, to one host plant species. Uh, some are relatively oligophagous, so they have maybe a few closely related host plant species, but generally they're oligophagous to um, quite polyphagous. So, Keeping track of the host information is important, um, but it will really never replace um, the reliance on, on morphological characters.